Hi friends, I'm Jess. Welcome to the Hex Library where I post reading, writing, book, and planner related content a couple of times a week. Today we're going to do my wrap up for the month of December. In the month of December I read nine books for a total of 2,792 pages which considering I basically took the month and was just like if I read a thing I read a thing and if I don't I don't. I feel like I did pretty good. There were definitely entire weeks where I did not even pick up a book and then there were weeks where I read three books in the same series in one week so um, it was definitely a little bit all over the place, but I had a good time. As always, we will start with the not rated books, then the lowest rated, and then on to the highest rated books for the month. Um, I had one reread in the month of December, and that was Dash and Lily's Book of Dares by Rachel Cohn and David Levithan. Um, I think this is my fourth time that I've reread that book. It's not the best book in the world, but I do really love rereading um, one of the Dash and Lily books during the winter holiday season. Something about New York at Christmas time makes me so very happy. I've discussed this at length in previous videos um, about where like the Midwest we just make New York at Christmas time be this perfect idealized version of Christmas in our heads and so reading Dash and Lily where they're traveling all over New York City leaving clues for each other and leaving dares for each other and so you're like getting to experience all of like the interesting sights of New York City during Christmas time. It's a, it's a great Christmas read. I also in December read Small Town Girl by Donna McLean, Love Lies and the Undercover Police. This book is not available in the US yet. I actually heard somebody talking about it in one of our um, readings. I was on somebody's reading sprints like I was just in the comments and they were talking about it on the channel and it sounded very interesting. Uh, basically Donna McLean had been in this relationship with a man named Carlo for a couple of years and then one day um, after they it kind of makes it sound like um, Carlo just like vanished and she never really found out like what happened to him but they had like a weird breakup where he had this like emotional where he had like a mental breakdown and they had to break up and he left her but really he was an undercover police officer and he was using her to infiltrate um, different activist groups in the UK and then it turns out that there were several of these men who were getting into long-term relationships with women um, throughout the years and they were all parts of undercover police officers so it was it was a hot mess. Raja, I'm currently filming and um, I, I can't hold you while I film. Yeah, so you're gonna have to hang out over there. Thank you. This is a memoir so I'm not reading it. The story was very interesting. There were definitely some things in this that made me so viscerally angry that I wanted to drive to the UK, find these men, punch them in the face and in the balls just for the hell of it. But also the way that this was written was very kind of haphazardly thrown together. I didn't really like the story structure itself. It was quite jumbled and hard to keep up with um, because she traveled through time so much like through each individual paragraph just like talking about her life with Carlo and then two years later and then her life with Carlo and then in the modern day and like in the decade that we're in but then also in the future and then also in, and it was just like a lot of that and if you've been here before you know that I really struggle with things where timelines are not in a, a consequential order consequential sequential order consequential wow sequential order that was a ride we just went on I don't know how y'all feel about that but that was a full ass trip anyway like the fact that you get into this story and you find out how many of these men were in like long-term relationships multiple years some decades long some of them married these women married them because I mean they aren't allowed to actually marry them um had children with these women uh, it one of the rules of the police force was that in order for them to be able to put be put on the special undercover mission was that they had to be married and have children because they didn't want the men to fall into the life of the um I'm sure you would rather see her than the book uh, but they didn't want them to fall into the life of the activists so the police officers that wanted to be put in as these 
undercover police officers for the activist groups had to be married and have children so that they would have something that would make them want to come back to the police force because they were being put so deep in undercover situations for so long. So, yeah. Can I help you? Or are we just holding Raja for a while? Okay. The next book that we're going to talk about is In Charm's Way by Lana Harper. This is the fourth book in the Witches of Thistle Grove series. I read it books two and three this month as well, um, but those are much further up the list. I gave In Charm's Way, I think it ended up at like a 2.5 stars, uh, but I ranted in my review so much that I decided to give it a two. So the Witches of Thistle Grove uh, start out being about a group of families that live in Thistle Grove. Um, each family, every so often the families have like this competition and whoever wins the competition that family is put as like the head of the families for that year. And this one specific family has been winning for so long that their family has so much more magic than all of the other clans of witches. And so the first book is like that kind of being taken care of. By the fourth book we're on to a character named Delilah who had her memories erased in book three and she was not a main like a main character like something happened in book three that caused her memories to be erased. Delilah is kind of a stuck up bitch throughout the book series. Um, anytime that we see her she is very like thinks she's better than everybody else, very standoffish, walks into a room thinking she's smarter than everybody in the room kind of deal you know. But her love interest was Kat. And Kat is a hot fucking mess whom I hate. I hated Kat so much, so viscerally much, that I wanted her to die so that I didn't have to continue reading their love story anymore. My notes say, A, this was not a romance, B, not a fun time, and C, bad. Just bad. My notes also says that Delilah was a righteous snob. Um, so the events that led her to losing her memories are part of book three, so I won't go into like great into detail into that about that. Um, but leave it to say that the person who um, caused the magic to take away her memories in book three, um, she treats this person very poorly and acts like, you know, this person did this purposefully which they did, but they were kind of under pressure and they just made a bad decision. But throughout this book, she's learning things about um, the people of the town and about Kat and just like making these decisions that don't make any sense. And it's like every step of the way, you're like, dude, you're becoming like that person that you hate so much. And yet you're still acting like you're so much better than her. And oh, are we going to run straight into spoilers? Let's run straight into mild spoilers. So Kat essentially is not a great character. Obviously from the way that I've discussed that I absolutely hate her. Um, their spicy scenes were the most uncomfortable thing for me to read on the planet because I hated Kat so much that it was just like hard to even sit through. Like I would just kind of like they would be playing and I would just do something else and like just fade out of the brain thought process and pretend like it wasn't even there you know and it was awful it was god awful I hated it. Delilah is basically telling Kat every town secret that's ever existed all of the secrets about the witches all of the secrets about her friends just like trusting Kat with every goddamn thing and her best friend Ivy who I have said is a fucking saint. Ivy is the best thing about this book. She's really the only reason why this book got any of the, the points that it got when it came to rating it. Um, because Ivy is a goddamn saint. And at one point Ivy was like, yo, Delilah, Kat is really changing who you are. And I don't think she's good for you. And you know, she's really taking advantage of you and doing these things that are harmful to you and to our people, to our city, to um, the witches of Thistle Grove. And Ivy's like, you need to make a choice whether the most important thing to you is Kat or me and everyone else. And Delilah's like, mm, I choose Kat. Uh, excuse me? Excuse. No, bitch. We don't, we don't do that. If, no, 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 no. 
no, no, no. If every single solitary person that you know is telling you that this bitch that you met two weeks ago is like evil and trying to take over you and the whole fucking town, then maybe don't trust the person that you've only known for two weeks. Maybe trust your best friend who you've been friends with your entire fucking life. It was, it was not a good time. It was not a good time. It was not a good time. Okay. There are actual spoilers in the review, which I will link down below. So if you want to know like actual, actual spoilers, you can go there and check those out. Um, but yeah, I had a terrible time reading that book. I wanted to yeet it into the atmosphere, but I did not. So bully for me. I also bought that book this month before I read it. So I guess I'm just holding a cat. I mean, she's full on asleep. I just... Why isn't you taking a nap? How, how are we going to hold books up? All right. Uh, next book we read. Where do I have the next book? I do. It's right here. Um, let's talk about these two together. I can hold them both up, I swear. Uh, we have Heartless and Blameless by Gail Carriger. These are books three and four. Is that right? Yeah, three and four in the Parasol Protectorate series. This series follows our main character, Alexia Tarabati. She is what is known as a soulless. And basically that means that she is lacking of a soul. Imagine that. Uh, but she lives in a world where there are vampires, werewolves, and ghosts. And vampires, werewolves, and ghosts are considered to be people who had at some point had extra soul and then are changed into those things and so a soulless if they touch a vampire or a werewolf they um while they're touching them transform them back into a human they lose their um non-human uh characteristics and if she touches a ghost's body they will be um what's the thing called exercised there we go Whew. I'm sorry, I'm distracted by this cat and I'm, my brain's not braining. Uh, also, my whole arm is numb from holding her for the last however many minutes it's been. So yeah, so basically she can exercise a ghost by touching it like it goes away forever. Anywho, uh, and the series follows her and it's like a romance set in the late 1800s, early 1900s um, between her and Lord Macon, who is Scottish and their banter is like the best absolute best banter of all time and I loved it I have been enjoying the series um like I said I read both of those fairly quickly back together back one back to back I gave Heartless 3.25 and Blameless Blameless 3.75 which I think Blameless was first they're good they're fun I have one more left to read and it's on the list for this month I have about seven days left on my hold in the library so I have to read it soon Hi, Raji. Okay, what's after that? Uh, I then read The House Next Door by Darcy Coates. I gave that a 3.75 out of 5 stars. It is about a woman who has lived next door to this haunted house for many years and one day she like sees the family run out in the middle of the night and then the house sits empty for a few months and then she notices a woman uh, move in. I believe yeah it's just that woman who moves in and she goes over and like makes friends with this lady um and the lady invites her in and she's like I don't know that I want to go in that house as many people as I've seen run out of it in the middle of the night I don't know that I want to go in that house but she does anyway um and so it's like her the ghost story of her and this lady um becoming friends and learning about the ghosts of the house and other things going on and it has a very interesting ending. Darcy's books a lot of times especially the haunted house ones will have like some weird twist that takes you to a place that you never thought it was going to take you and I don't wouldn't necessarily say that it has like a weird twist but it definitely has a weird ending like the way everything ends up at the end the way things settle for the end of the book it's definitely weird. Are you okay buddy? You are are you good? Because I'm going to have to roll up so I can move on to the next book. You think you can handle that? Uh, we can talk about these two next. From Bad to Cursed and Back in a Spell. Uh, I gave both of these four out of five stars. These are books two and three in The Witches of Thristle Grove. And no, I don't know which one is which. I think it's Back in a Spell and then From Bad to Cursed. But I always think that and then it's the opposite direction. 
Uh, yeah, book three is naive. Okay, bye Raj. So From Bad to Curse is the second book and Back in a Spell is the third book. Like I said, I always get them backwards. Uh, but I gave these both a four. Four out of five stars. So the second book follows Isadora Avramov and she was one of the characters that we met in the first book and it also follows it also follows Rowan Thorne who was one of the champions from the first book um, and it is their romance. They it's definitely an enemies to lover trope. Um, they've known each other like their whole lives like because they've all grown up in this town together and I, I really loved this one. This one had some really great um, interesting topics because the Thorns are a predominantly black family. There's some talk between him and Isadora about fear of the secret of witches in this town being let out and how other people um, would use their magic for their own gain. And it is from Rowan's point of view talking about like the exploitation of slave labor um, and basically saying that, you know, he understands the fear of that because it is something that he has had to live with his whole life of um, something that his ancestors would have had to have dealt with and he has to deal with still the things that happen in modern day because of that. So it had some very interesting topics on that aspect of it. Um, also I just love their romance. It was, this one was a fun time. This was a great ride. I don't know what the fuck In Charm's Way was but this was great. Also what was fucking great? Nynaeve. Uh, <laughs> Nynaeve is a Blackmore and the Blackmores are the family that are like the richest of all of the witches and she actually this is her romance with Morty Gutierrez who is a a normie in their town but he like weirdly gets powers because something weird happens to him and it is like their coming together him trying to get help from Nynaeve with his powers and like them coming together and like having this romance and it is so good like this one is probably my favorite of the four um i did enjoy the first book uh, as well the second book great nine even and, and morty so good morty is non-binary uh, but he does typically use he him pronouns he does occasionally use they them pronouns but he pretty much has said in the book that um it it's not like a either is fine kind of thing like neither like he him pronouns don't bother him but they them pronouns also don't bother him so it's like a whichever you prefer to use is okay with him and Nynaeve predominantly uses he him pronouns for him which is why that is what I'm using because Nynaeve is the narrator of the story. Um, I have heard some um, comments about people who have read the book uh, basically saying that they don't really know about the validity of Morty as a non-binary character uh, because they don't feel like he has like a non-binary personality. They feel like the author just took a um, a male presenting character, threw him in a dress, and then threw him on the page. And I obviously am not the right demographic to discuss whether or not I think that that's accurate. Um, it was not from that demographic that I have heard those complaints. Um, so I don't know like the validity of that. Um, but I do think that I thought I found um, Morty's character to be well done as far as showing like the non-binary aspects of it. But again, not from that demographic, so I could be not correct on that. Um, but it is there. It exists. It was a fantastic romance. I really enjoyed it. I also really love Nynaeve. Mostly I just like her name, honestly. And my highest rated book of the month was The Book Club Hotel by Sarah Morgan. I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 stars. If you have been here before around Christmas time, you may know that I typically always read a Sarah Morgan in December. Sarah Morgan writes a lot of like women's fic, um, a lot of chick lit, women's fiction, romance, whatever you want to call it. Like that is predominantly what Sarah Morgan writes, which is not my favorite thing to read 95% of the year. But her Christmas books really work for me. And I think it's because Christmas is a time when I am already feeling like nostalgia and sappy and romantic and like I can handle that those kind of topics. A lot of times with that particular genre like set in a normal like just random Tuesday in June setting it doesn't really work for me. But when you throw it in the middle of winter at Christmas in some kind of a cozy location it works for me. 
Um, I had a fantastic time. This one follows three best friends who every year have gotten together what they call like the hotel book club. And so because they live in three separate areas, they would rent a hotel together, go there for the weekend, and discuss a book that they had read. One of the women is very high up in her career and travels all the time. She's never settled down. She's never been married. She doesn't have any children. Um, she is very much like not attached to anyone. And that does deal with some of her childhood trauma, which was a fun time to read um, as a woman who is in her mid thirties and never married and never been in a long standing relationship or have children. Mm, I don't know. Uh, one of our other characters has been married since they were very young um, and has two children who are about to, they were twins and this is their senior year in, in high school. So they're about to leave the nest and she's having to deal with having an empty house. And the other character um, is, a, is a bit in between the two. She has been with a man for a, about a decade in a long standing relationship and she has a job that she really enjoys. And when we're meeting her at the beginning of this book, she has lost both her job and her boyfriend has dumped her. So we have like these three contrasting characters. And then our fourth character is the lady who owns the hotel that they decide to go to. Um, and she was married has a five-ish year old daughter. Um, her husband passed away two years prior um, due to a freak accident and this hotel was his dream and she's trying to keep everything the same as what it was when he was there, um, keep the same staff, keep the same like traditions and everything that he ran because that was his dream and she's really struggling with that um, and also has a new crush and so dealing with falling in love again while having feelings for her dead husband. So the book was fantastic. Like there were, okay, so it's like super sappy. It made me cry. I sobbed, I wept. It was, it was a time, okay? Um, we all know that I'm gonna sob and weep. And the way that the characters are connected was, was so well done. There's just like this, I talk about this every time. When I read The Bookish Life of Nina Hill, um, where we get to see uh, Nina, whose dad has like six other kids over like a, 50 year time span and you see what kind of a father he was to all of these children like in each decade and how different he was through each decade to each child. Um, you get to see that with these characters about how much a person can change in a decade and how they can be a completely different person and it doesn't have anything to do with like you. Like the way someone else treats me doesn't have anything really to do with me, but it has to do with has to do with the journey that they are on and how the things that are happening in their life affect the way that they react to that uh, less than to do with me myself, unless I am the thing that's being the asshole and causing them to react. Um, but that is for another topic for another day. Um, but yeah, just seeing like that aspect of like how things can change. Ah, so good. So good. I really love that story. Um, you can, like, you know where things are going to go, like, from the first few chapters, you know how things are going to end up. Um, you're not reading it because, you're, like, you're, like, it's not like a thriller. You're not like, what's going to happen next? Like, you know what's going to happen next. Um, it's just really low stakes and fun, and you're just there for the Christmassy vibes, and I loved it. Um, so here are the, some of the books that I read in December. Let me know down in the comments if you have read any of these before, or if you are interested in reading them in the future. Do you have any comments, questions? or concerns, the comment section is where you would take those. If you made it this far in the video, leave me a candle emoji in the comments down below. You know, for Nynaeve, because we love her. That's all I have for today. I will see you guys next time. Bye!